Okay, hello everyone. We're going to talk a little bit about nuclear reactions. So, so far, if you think about this uh, unit so far, we've talked about many different kinds of energies. We've talked about um, mechanical energy, which is the sum of kinetic and potential. And we've talked about uh, heat as a way of transferring thermal energy. And now we're going to look at another kind of energy, one that probably don't really think about too much in your daily life, but it turns out to be just as important as the others, uh, at least here in Ontario. Um, and that's nuclear energy. Now, look, nuclear energy gets a lot, sometimes gets a bad rap. Um, and I'm not really going to speak to that necessarily. Uh, it is quite controversial. There's no doubt about it. But in this case, I'm just going to focus on the physics of it, right? How does it work? What, what do we have to consider? And... Uh, you know, what are the implications for us as a society? I'll touch on that, I suppose, a little bit at the end. So here we go. Uh, let me talk about a nuclear reaction. We're necessarily talking about the nucleus of an atom. So if you remember, an atom is composed of broadly two parts. There's the nucleus, which is the part that contains the protons and the neutrons at the center. And then surrounding that, there are the electrons. So in a nuclear reaction, we don't care about the electrons. It's only the nucleons only the nuclei uh, that matter and we have to collide them with each other. Whenever you have a nuclear reaction you can guarantee that there will be a large amount of energy released. So again atoms consist of a nucleus at the middle in the center and electrons that orbit the nucleus and so here is a um, uh, bohr rutherford diagram for example and you can see that in this case we have a nitrogen atom. The yellow in this diagram represent the protons. The orange balls represent the neutrons. And surrounding them in the white are the little uh, electrons. Okay? And they, those different uh, nuclear, the, the different uh, particles that make up the atom. Are, have different charges, different electrical charges. So the electron, we say, has a charge of negative one, a proton has a charge of positive one, and a neutron is neutral, it has a zero charge. Okay, so again, you probably have seen this before in chemistry or perhaps in an earlier um, you know, grade, grade nine or grade 10. Whenever we write down an element, we have three parts to it. There's the atomic number, which is basically the number of protons. There's the mass number, which is the sum of the protons and neutrons. And then there's just the chemical symbol that is unique for each element. So as an example, we might have beryllium, which has, uh, which has Be as its chemical symbol. Beryllium has four protons, and it also has five neutrons, which is why its mass number is nine, right? Four plus five is nine. Uh, when, when we talk about different elements, we often talk about different elemental, uh, different elements may have different isotopes. So isotopes, just to remind you, are atoms that have the same number of protons. So any, so every isotope of carbon, for example, will have six protons. However, uh, those, those different isotopes will have uh, a different number of neutrons. So, yeah. So, for example, in the case of carbon, the atoms uh, are not going to be the same mass, right? The different isotopes will have different mass. Some will be heavier, some will be lighter. So, carbon has three, um, like the three most abundant isotopes of carbon are carbon 13, carbon 14, and carbon 12. Carbon 12 is the most abundant. Right? It's the one that makes up 90 plus percent of the carbon on Earth. But there are two other isotopes, carbon-13 and carbon-14. Uh, so those ones have different number of neutrons uh, than does carbon-12. Right, carbon-14 is actually radioactive, and meaning that, well, we'll get to radioactive decay in a moment, but basically carbon-14 is uh, the element that's often used to date um, artifacts, archaeological artifacts. Okay, um, 
hydrogen also has isotopes. So there are three isotopes of hydrogen, uh, hydrogen three, hydrogen two, and hydrogen one. So hydrogen one is the normal, is the regular one, the one that you're most familiar with probably. Hydrogen two is basically, has an extra, pro uh, extra neutron, I apologize. And that one is called deuterium or heavy hydrogen sometimes. And hydrogen three is called tritium. Uh, tritium is radioactive, so again, it will decay. Okay, so I've been talking about radioactive isotopes, and so those are sometimes just known as radioisotopes, isotopes that are radioactive. So what does that mean to be radioactive? I mean, you see these pictures of, like, barrels of radioactive waste, and you, you know, kind of understand that it's dangerous, but what does that really mean? Well, a radioisotope is unstable, meaning that over time, it will actually uh, spontaneously change the element, or like change what it's what it's made of, essentially, um, through a nuclear process. And these nuclear processes uh, release energy in the form of radiation. And it's that energy release, that radiation, that's actually the dangerous part. So the so the so technically speaking, the 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 decaying isn't the dangerous part. It's the what comes out after the decay or during the decay that can be the dangerous part, at least to us. So essentially, you're looking at a disintegration, or at the very least, a reorganization of an atomic of an atom's nucleus. And that's really what we mean by radioactive decay. Um, so some of you were, so radiation is a word that we saw in the previous, like last week's work. Radiation is basically one of the ways that um, Heat, tra uh, heat transfer occurs, right? Conduction and convection are the other two. And so whenever we talk about radiation, we're, we're necessarily talking about electromagnetic waves. Well, okay, what's an electromagnetic wave? I'm not gonna get too deep into it here uh, because the next unit of study is actually all about waves. But I will say that waves have, one thing that makes um, waves special is that they have a wavelength and a frequency. and um, the wavelength or the frequency is a way of sort of describing, you know, what might separate one wave or what might distinguish one wave from another. Here's the electromagnetic spectrum, and so you can see that there's only a very small amount of it that we can actually detect with our eye. It's this part here, the visible spectrum. Everything else is invisible to us, meaning that we can't see it with our eye. We didn't need, like, other kinds of tools. Um, nevertheless, all of these things are part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So for instance, down here you have uh, radio waves, uh, then microwaves. Again, many of you were talking about microwaves last week um, <clears throat> as an example. Infrared rays, this is, this is typically what you talk about when you're talking about radiant heat. So for those people who are talking about, you know, the sun's rays, really this is how the sun transfers most of its energy is via infrared. Although some people were talking about the ultraviolet, which is also true. There's also the visible, but anyway, that's let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. So basically up until about here, which is like, you know, fairly deep into the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, this is non-ionizing. So non-ionizing doesn't exactly mean not dangerous, but ionizing radiation is very dangerous, okay? So although it shows kind of a, hard cut off here. Um, so, the, so the ionizing radiation, the part that we need to worry about are gamma rays, which we'll talk about shortly, x-rays, which you may be familiar with from your last visit to, I don't know, the dentist or something, and then ultraviolet, which, you know, as you may know, can damage your skin if you're outside too long without sunscreen. So in general, it says here, increasing wavelength now what it doesn't show on here is the frequency the frequency is actually goes the opposite way so if wavelength increases this way frequency increases this way to the right and as the frequency increases so does the energy uh, so that means that basically over here right if we just look at the energy this is all the high energy stuff this is the dangerous stuff whereas this is the low energy stuff and what makes ionizing radiation, like why, it get, why it's given that name, is that it actually has enough energy in one, um, well, I'll talk about photons, I suppose, shortly. But basically, it has enough energy to take an electron, 
out of an atom, right? It has enough energy that if it hits an atom, it can actually pop an electron out of that atom and create a positively charged ion. Okay. So, what is radioactive decay? I've talked about these radioisotopes and how they spontaneous decay, spontaneously decay, but what's that all about? Well, it turns out there are three ways that this can happen. Um, so, during a decay process, you basically have your, your nucleus and it breaks apart and forms different atoms. Well, what do, let's just get some definitions down. First of all, let's talk about the thing that we start with, or the reactant, if you will, for the chemists out there. We're going to call that the parent atom. And then whatever comes out the other side, whatever is left over after the decay is done, we're going to call that the daughter atom. And sometimes there may be more than one daughter atom. Okay, so the three most common kinds of uh, radioactive decay, or at least the ones that are um, appropriate for this course, are alpha, beta, and gamma decay. And each of these three processes um, involves a different uh, decay mechanism. Okay, so first up, let's look at alpha decay. What makes alpha decay alpha decay is that it emits something called an alpha particle. So you're going to see this in all three kinds of decay. One, one thing that separates the three decay, uh, um, or one thing that distinguishes the three decay mechanisms is that they each emit a special kind of particle. So in the case of alpha decay, you get an alpha particle. Well, what's that? Okay, so let's say we start off with some big unstable nucleus, right? This giant bundle of stuff. Um, well, that's going to spontaneously decay into something smaller and more stable as well as this alpha particle. Now what's interesting about the alpha particle, and I think this, this diagram is a bit off there, but anyway, the alpha particle has the same structure as a helium nucleus. And if you're not sure, a helium nucleus has two protons and two neutrons, okay? So what's interesting is that on Earth, as you, you may know, that there's actually a fair bit of helium, but what you may not know is that most of that helium is actually created from uh, decay of larger radioactive sources. It usually happens underground. <clears throat> okay, so like I said, the alpha particle has the same structure as a same nucleus as a helium atom. It has a mass of mass number of four and a charge of plus two, so two protons, two neutrons, and it just has that symbol right there. Although sometimes to show that it's an alpha particle coming from a decay, we may use that symbol, so the alpha symbol. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Okay, so an alpha particle would therefore be one of the daughter atoms uh, from, uh, from an alpha decay, but um, the more, but we don't really think about it in that, in that sense, we normally think of the other thing. So for example, if I have some parent atom which decays via an alpha process, I'm necessarily going to get an alpha particle. That's, again, one of the byproducts of an alpha decay. But I'm also going to have this daughter atom. Okay, and hopefully this will be a little bit more concrete when I do an example. These letters here, the A and Z and all that sort of stuff, this will make more sense when we do an example. Okay, so uh, an atom of... Uh, Radon 226 decays into uh, radon 222, and an alpha particle is emitted. All right, so how is this working out here? How do we know that this is correct? Well, remember that the alpha particle has a mass number of four. I can't really write here, but I'm just kind of showing it. So there's a mass number of four and um, atomic number of two, okay? It's because, again, it's the same thing as a helium uh, nucleus. So what you can basically think of this, even though it doesn't have an equal sign, I want you to think about these uh, decay reactions as actually equations. And what you need to do is you need to look at the numbers on the top and the numbers on the bottom, and they have to add up um, to be the same. Here's what I mean. So on the left-hand side here, I have 226, right? My mass number is 226. So that means that on the right side of the equation, this atom has 222, so I need something here, which I add to 222 to get 226. Well, that something has to be 4, 
right? Because 4 plus 222 is 226. Similarly, if I look at the atomic numbers, on the left-hand side I have 88. On the right-hand side I have 86. Well, what plus 86 equals 88? Well, it has to be 2. So 2 plus 86 equals 88. So just based on very simple, you know, uh, um, arithmetic, you can always work out what, uh, what the thing is over here that, um, that might be missing. Now this is kind of a silly example because an alpha particle is always 4 and 2. But what might, but what might happen is that I might say, okay, well this thing decays producing an alpha particle, what's this guy? Okay, so again, hopefully you can see this. 226 equals 222 plus 4. 88 equals 86 plus 2. So again, all the numbers have to match. The two sides of the equation have to balance, regardless of what the actual elements are. The elements are kind of irrelevant, actually. All right, so the second kind of decay is beta, and beta emits what's called a beta particle. Well, what's a beta particle? It turns out a beta particle is actually an electron. So um, an electron is um, has a mass of zero, because although it's not actually a mass of zero, it's very, very light with respect to, say, a proton or a neutron. It's about one one-thousandth the mass of those. But it has a charge of negative one. Okay, so this is the so the symbol often used for the beta particle is uh, we might use an e to show that it's an electron, again with a mass number of zero and atomic number of negative one. Alternatively, you might use this Greek uh, letter beta. Um, and likewise, again, you get the same kind of thing. When we have a parent atom, it will decay into a daughter atom which will actually be a completely different element, and as well as uh, spit out a beta particle. Okay, so this is, in general, the, um, the reaction for a beta decay. Whatever it is we started with, the parent will decay into something plus our electron. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, an atom of carbon-14 decays into nitrogen-14 and a beta particle is emitted. Okay, well, how do we set this one up? Well, here it goes. Carbon-14. Carbon has uh, a, an atomic number of 6, and 14, um, mass number of 14, right? That's what carbon-14, the, the number after the element always refers to the mass number. And so that decays into nitrogen-14. Nitrogen has uh, a, an atomic number of 7, mass number 14, and the beta particle. So again, if you just think of this as an equation, a math equation, 14 equals 14 plus something, well, that something has to be zero. So we know straight away, even if we didn't know anything about a beta particle, we'd know that it'd have to have a mass number of zero. And likewise, 6 equals 7 plus something, well, that something has to be a negative 1. 7 minus 1 equals 6. So again, just by this, we can say that the beta particles uh, prop, uh, we know what the beta particles um, uh, mass number and atomic number are. Zero for the mass number, negative one for the atomic number. <clears throat> okay, the last kind of decay that we're gonna talk about is gamma decay. Now, this one is a little weird because you don't actually, it almost seems like there's nothing that happens to the radioactive uh, isotope, and that's not exactly true. Gamma decay is often a, often accompanies one of the other kinds of decay. So we might have alpha decay that also spits out a gamma particle. But <clears throat> in this case, what we're talking about is where we have some kind of um, uh, radioisotope um, that's in an excited state, meaning it has extra energy. And the way that it gives off that energy, the way that it gets rid of that excess energy, it doesn't like being energetic is it uh, has to release a gamma ray, or a photon, as you might say. Um, so similarly to alpha and beta, beta radiation, it has its own symbol. This is the Greek letter gamma. Now the funny thing about photons, right, this, this uh, sometimes this is called a particle, 
and sometimes it's called a photon. In this case, the two are kind of interchangeable. But if you remember, um, gamma radiation was on that electromagnetic spectrum we had a few slides back. So electromagnetic radiation doesn't, it's not really, it's, well, in grade 12 we'll do this, I suppose. But for now, anyway, we're not going to really think about it as a particle. It's really more of a wave. So what does that mean? Well, that means that it has no mass, but it also has no charge. It's just a wave. It's just a packet of energy. So in that case, both of these numbers are going to be zero. All right. So again, the general equation when something um, decays via gamma is that the parent and the daughter are actually the same. But to show that this one was at a higher energy, we actually use an asterisk here just to show that it was in some kind of excited state. It had extra energy that it had to get rid of in the way of the photon. <clears throat> okay, well, these are really, these are almost foolishly simple to write down. An atom of helium-3 in the excited state undergoes a gamma decay to produce an atom in helium-3 in a stable state. There you go. So the parent, again, this is the one with the little asterisk, decays to produce the daughter and a photon. Okay, so there you go. In the shortened form, there's the photon again using that gamma symbol and the two zeros. All right. Now, one thing that you may have seen in your math class uh, when you're talking about exponential functions is something called half-life uh, or exponential decay. So exponential decay is kind of a funny one, but essentially there's this very mathematical uh, equation that tells us how quickly or how much of something we're going to have, how much of a, of a radioactive isotope we're going to have after a certain length of time. And so this is governed by something called the half-life. So broadly speaking, half-life is the amount of time required for half the nuclei in a sample to, to undergo radioactive decay. Now remember, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that when those nuclei uh, decay, they're not gone, they're just something else. Um, sometimes you're, you're going to graph half-life. So let's say for the sake of argument that we started with uh, bismuth, a sample of bismuth. And bismuth decays every, uh, has a half-life of about five days. So let's say that we start with 100 grams uh, on day zero. Then five days later, we're going to have half of what we started with, which is 50 grams. Five days after that, we're going to have half of what we had here, which is then 25 grams. Five days, five days after that, we're going to have half again, so we're going to have 12.5 grams, and so on and so forth. So it's always halving, right? After each, so after the number of days have passed, in this case five, um, five days being the half-life, we always have half the amount of bismuth. So here's how we might graph that, right? So on day zero, we have 100 grams. On day five, we have 50 grams, and so on and so forth. So again, for those of you who have taken your functions course, you'll recognize this as an exponential decay function, right? So strictly speaking, it never gets to zero, but at some point, you're just going to not have a whole heck of a lot of it left. So this is the equation that we use for half-life. So basically A0, just to work you through here, A is the amount of stuff that we have at the end. A0 is the amount of stuff that we have at the beginning. T is the amount of time that passes. And H is the half-life. And then there's always this one half that shows up in there because as you remember from the previous slide, we're always halving the amount that we started with uh, in the previous step. So that's why the half is in there, because we're, well, it's half, we're halfing it. <clears throat> okay, so let's say that we have uh, a sample of iodine-131, which has a half-life of eight days. What mass of iodine will remain from a 25-gram sample after 32 days? Well, so one thing we could certainly do is uh, we could just plug the numbers into the equation. So if we go through here, uh, we have a half-life of eight days. Half-life of eight days, that means I would put eight here for H. What mass of iodine will remain from a 25-gram sample? Well, 25 grams, 
I put 25 in for A0. That's how much I started with, right? Initial sample, initial sample means how much did I start with? In this case, 25 grams. So 25 grams would go there. And then 32 days is the amount of time that passes. So 32 would go into here. So I'd have 25 grams times one half raised to the power, right? This is an exponent of 32 divided by eight. So 32 divided by eight is four. And I'd work this through in my calculator and I would get 1.6 grams. Um, here's another one. Thallium 201 has a half-life of 72.9 hours. So again, this is the half-life, half-life. What percent of an initial sample will remain after 143 hours? Well, 143 hours, that's the time. That would go there. It says, what percent? Hmm. Well, since we're talking with percents, I'm just going to say that the starting percent is 100, right? However much it's like, you know, the most you can get on a test, for example, is 100%. So that's how much I'd start with, 100%. And then I'd work it through, right? So this would be 100. This would be 143. This would be 72.9. Work it through on my calculator, and I get 25.7%. Okay, I'm just going to move through that one. <clears throat> okay, so some of the things that we've talked about in science before is, and particularly energy, is we've talked about how energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can just change forms. There's a similar law for mass, and that mass can neither be, mass cannot be created or destroyed. It can just change forms, I suppose, right? Like think about uh, ice turning into water, turning into steam. Um, well, so that's fine. Uh, and again, we know that in any given uh, atom, we have that we have a, a nucleus of an atom made up of protons and neutrons. So it turns out because of uh, some very uh, sophisticated measurements, we actually know what the mass of a proton and a neutron is. So it makes kind of sense that we could just go ahead and Say, okay, carbon-14. Well, I know that carbon-14 has six protons and eight neutrons, so I know what the mass of those are, and I'm just going to add them up, and that'll tell me what the mass of a carbon-14 nucleus is. Pretty simple. Here's the thing, though. Again, those very sophisticated measurements that I was talking about show that that's not actually the answer. If you add up all the masses of, of the protons and, and neutrons that there should be, that actually doesn't turn out to be the mass of the actual nucleus. That's really weird. It's like, but I have, like in the case of carbon-14, carbon, carbon, uh, carbon 14, I have six protons, I have eight neutrons, I just add them up, like, you know, in my calculator, I add them up, and that should be the answer, but it turns out it isn't. In fact, it turns out it's less. The nucleus has less mass than all the parts, right? Let me just say that again. If you add up all the parts, if you add up all the masses of the individual parts of a nucleus, the actual nucleus has less mass than those parts. So somehow if you take, uh, again, if I take carbon-14 as my example, I have six protons, I have eight neutrons, I know how much mass those have, and then I jam them together to actually make a carbon-14 nucleus, then I somehow lost mass along the way. What? That doesn't make any sense. Where did the mass go? Okay, so here's another example. In the case of helium, if you take the mass of two protons and two neutrons, you get this number. Don't worry about the units here. Uh, these aren't like, these are, these are called atomic units or atomic mass units. Um, they're not important to us uh, in this case, but we're not gonna use kilograms because you just have really, really small numbers. But the idea here is that if, I just just look at the number here, if you take the mass of these things, you get really just a little bit more than four, right? 4.03188. But then as soon as you glom them all together and you make the nucleus, now you have 4.001503. So this guy, where they've all been glommed together, has less mass than these four guys separated. Okay, so that missing mass is called the mass deficit or mass defect, depending on who you read. And how does this work? Well, it turns out that proton, the protons and neutrons held, are held together 
by something called the strong nuclear force. I want to try and give you this, give you, give you this, like how this makes sense because you might not, might not kind of realize what the hell do you mean by, what do you mean by a strong nuclear force? Well, see the thing is, protons have a positive charge, and as you may remember, things that have the same charge, right, positively charged, for example, they don't like being around each other. They repel each other. So the fact that these protons can live next to each other and not fight, not like repel one another, is a consequence of them being held in place. And the thing that holds them in place is the strong nuclear force. The neutrons play a role as well, but it's the strong nuclear force that basically keeps the nucleus bound together. If that strong nuclear force weren't there, everything would fly apart. So that basically is that energy required to keep everything held together. That's the binding energy. Okay. However much energy it keeps to bind the nucleus together, keep the keep the nucleons from flying apart, that's called the binding energy. Okay. Now we're going to bring this back to mass and energy. So we talked about how mass cannot be created or destroyed. It can only change forms. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only change forms. Turns out that's not 100% true. Once we start getting into nuclear systems, then you can actually convert mass into energy and energy into mass. So we have to change our law of our law slightly and say that really we have a law of conservation of mass energy, right? Mass can turn into energy, and energy can turn into mass, but the total amount of mass energy has got to stay the same. Now I have to tell you, folks, that this only that this law really only kicks in in physics. In chemistry, the kinds of things that you worry about they don't involve turning mass into energy. In biology, same difference. But in physics, once you start getting into nuclear reactions, now all of a sudden we have to worry about the total amount of mass energy. So this is really almost like a, a nuclear physics specific law. No, well, sort of. Okay, and this brings us to the most famous physics equation of all time. You've probably seen this. It's usually next to a picture of Einstein, you know, the guy with all the crazy hair. E equals mc squared, right? Probably the most famous physics equation ever, and nobody knows what it means. Well, I'm hoping that you can actually... Um, a guess based on what I was just talking about. What do you think the E stands for? What have we been using it for all this time? Energy. We've been E, so E means energy. And M, well, what have we, we've been using mass all this for all this time. Oh, I just gave it away, didn't I? M stands for mass, gosh. So E stands for energy, M stands for mass, and C squared. Now you might be thinking that C is like specific heat capacity because that's what we just were talking about last week, but it turns out no. C stands for something else in this case. So Albert Einstein proposed this equation, which relates the energy and the mass, and says that you can actually, that they are equivalent. You can turn energy into mass. You can turn mass into energy. But then there's this C squared over here. And C is the speed of light in a vacuum. Now you might be wondering, what in the heck does the speed of light in a vacuum have to do with this equation? Well, that's a story for another day. For now, it's just I'll just let you know that that's what the C in this equation stands for. It's the speed of light in a vacuum. Approximately 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Very fast. Faster than your car even. Okay, now let's get back to this whole idea of binding energy or mass deficit, if you prefer. So the idea is that we've lost some energy when we when we take when we take those nucleons and press them together into a nucleus. We're using the mass, some of the mass that makes up those nucleons, and converting it into the energy that we require to keep them bound together. That's where that that's where this equals mc squared is going to come in. So here's an example um, for lithium seven. The mass deficit, right? The missing mass, if you will, is this much. And we want to know how much binding energy does that correspond to? Well, you just take this, pop it into e equals mc squared. Again, remember the squared on the on the on this guy. Don't don't forget the squared there. That often that often gets you. Um, so you take this number of kilograms, which is almost nothing, right? Like this seems like so small, ten to the negative twenty nine. Oh my goodness! But you're multiplying it by c squared, and c is already a pretty big number. And then when you square it, you get an even bigger number. So it turns out that the energy here is still quite low. 10 to the negative 12 joules, but I mean, it's something. Okay, 
We're now going to talk about two, so we've talked about the three kinds of nuclear decays, alpha, beta, and gamma. Now we've talked about this whole idea of the binding energy. Now we're going to put this all together and talk about two other kinds of nuclear reactions. And these are the ones that, again, for us in our modern world, are probably the ones that are the most important. So the first one is fission, one where a nucleus gets split into two smaller nuclei. All right, so this is the one that matters the most for us in our modern life because all those nuclear reactors that we have in Ontario uh, are fission reactors. The other one is fusion. So this is where two small nuclei become one larger nucleus. This is also really important to us in our daily life, although not necessarily on Earth, because the sun uh, is, is a giant fusion reactor, right? The sun basically converts hydrogen into, well, helium perhaps, or into some other uh, hydrogen isotope um, and, uh, and releases energy, which obviously comes to us. So both of these reactions are very important for us. One, because in the case of fission, this is a man-made reaction. In the case of fusion, that's a natural reaction. And in both of those reactions, you get a lot of energy. Um, so again, for, for you chemists out there, you might be thinking, okay, well, I know about different kinds of reactions in chemistry and how much energy gets released there. Well, typically in a fission reaction, you get about a million times more energy than in a typical chemical reaction and in fusion it's even greater. So this is why for example you sometimes read in the sometimes read in the news about how the ongoing research into fusion energy because if we could actually um, you know create a fusion reactor something that simulates what's happening in the sun but here on earth you know in a safe controlled way then that would basically solve our uh, energy needs for eternity. <clears throat> okay, so here's basically a graphic of a fusion reaction. So here's a uranium-235 nucleus getting bombarded by a neutron. And then this basically causes the uranium-235 to split into xenon-134 and strontium-100. And then you also get out extra neutrons. Um, in the case of fusion, here I have deuterium and tritium. Right? This is hydrogen 2 and hydrogen 3. They fuse together to form helium and an additional neutron. Okay. Um, okay, so when we talk about splitting atoms via nuclear fusion, sometimes, uh, as we've talked about, Unstable nuclear, uh, ra like radioisotopes, will just split spontaneously sometimes. But that's not actually very interesting. For us, or I should say for those nuclear engineers who run um, the different plants in Ontario, they're going to be bombarding the uranium with neutrons. So, they, so they're, they're not worried about the spontaneous reactions. They want to control the reaction. And this is why they use neutrons. Neutrons basically make the reaction go. <clears throat> So in this graphic, which I hope you can see, we've got a neutron coming in. Now this is obviously like not to scale, but we form uranium-236. It splits, and more neutrons are released. Now those neutrons that are released are actually really important because we, want, we don't want to just fire in one neutron and get one reaction, and then that's it, the end of the story we actually want this reaction to continue. So these two neutrons that are released here in the graphic, those will in principle go on and interact with other uranium-235 atoms, uh, nuclei I should say, and keep this process going. So you get kind of a chain reaction. So here's the, here's the uh, equation. And what I want you to, and I wanna, what I wanna point out is that the, uh, you know, the same idea of the, the products, if you will, and the reactants, they have, to, they have to conserve mass, charge, and energy. So the mass is the numbers along the top. So 235 plus 1 is 236. So that's my budget. That's how much mass I have to work with. And if I look at the reactants, I have 92 plus 142 
So that's uh, 234. Um, yeah, and then I have two more neutrons to give me the 236 that I had over on this side. Okay, so I can't like just make mass out of nothing. Then if I look at the charge, the charge of the numbers along the bottom. 92 plus 0 is 92. And so if I look at this side, 36 plus 56 is 92. So again, I've conserved charge. The energy part of it, we don't really worry too much about in this grade. We worry more so about the uh, not just the mass of the charge. Just know that there's going to be energy released. Okay, so like I've been saying, uh, nuclear power uh, exists around the world, and specifically here in Ontario. Not all provinces in Canada have nuclear reactors, but we in Ontario do. In fact, about 50%, last time I looked it up, about 50% of the electrical energy in Ontario is produced from nukes. And um, unlike, unlike most other kinds of, uh, you know, burning fo fossil fuels or whatever, you know, no pollutants are released into the atmosphere, um, but there is radioactive waste that has to be contained and stored. So here's a picture of, um, I forget which one this is, if this is Darlington or Bruce, I always forget. Anyhow, um, so uh, yeah, so the, the, the nuclear power stations in Canada are sometimes known as CANDU reactors, so Canadian deuterium uranium. Deuterium is basically the heavy water that uh, sits in the um, uh, in the reactor vessel, and um, this is different from many of the other kinds of. Uh, it's a it's a lot safer than, um, for example, some of the other nuclear like you may have heard of some of the nuclear disasters around the world that have happened, like for, perhaps at Chernobyl, that one was pretty famous, or more recently at Fukushima. Those ones did not use deuterium. Now, it's not entirely clear that uh, what happened to them... Well, in the case of Chernobyl, I know that what happened there is not possible with the way that the CANDU reactors are designed. Uh, Fukushima, I don't know enough about what happened at that one to, be, to say for sure. Okay, lastly, go, talking about nuclear fission. Uh, again, as I mentioned, we have two smaller nuclei that get pressed together to form a larger nucleus. So again, in this example, deuterium and tritium get pressed together to form helium, as well as an extra neutron, and we get this energy released. Don't worry about what the numbers mean. Uh, so if this, so yeah, if you actually want fusion to occur, it has to occur at very high temperature or very high pressure. Inside of a star would work very well. Um, and it produces a large amount of energy. On Earth, uh, like I said, the, uh, there's been a lot of research into controlled fusion reactions, but it's never really been successful. Um, I mean, they can get it to work, but only under very limited uh, situations, so it's not practical as a way of producing energy. In an uncontrolled situation, well, they got this to work in the 1950s, 1940s, 1950s, 1940s, sorry. And this was the hydrogen bomb. So this is the, it's the same basic reaction, right? Again, this follows along our same rules. The masses have to work out. So two plus three is five, four plus one is five. So yep, charges have to be equal. One plus one is two, two plus zero is two. So this works, this is a good reaction. At least it, mathematically it works. Um, there we go. Uh, and that was a picture taken of when the hydrogen bomb was detonated. Um, okay, that I didn't actually need. So that's basically it. Um, I gave, I've gone over a lot of a lot of information here, um, and uh, I thank you to those of you who stuck it out till the end. Um, but that's basically the deal, right? So we've got. Nuclear reactions, we've got the decay reactions, the alpha, beta, and the gamma, and we've got the uh, uh, the, the uh, nuclear fusion and nuclear fission, and as well as equals mc squared. That kind of tells us about the whole um, uh, way of converting energy into mass and mass into energy. So I hope that was helpful, and 
now you should know everything you need to go and check out some problems. Thanks, folks. Cheers.